All right, I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, coming on to this, uh, for this interview. Uh, Michael is the founder of Smarter German, and he provides a service for people out there learning German. And um, we're interviewing Michael at Glossika here because uh, we're starting to work together. And we're really excited about this uh, because Michael has developed some really great content that we would like to share on the Glossika platform. And uh, Michael, of course, has a, has a platform and uh, a, a lot of learners through his system. But I think that uh, some of this synergy and working together, uh, we can really um, make some interesting collaboration because uh, as you know, Glossika has uh, that screen interface, uh, some engagement with um, typing and listening and speaking. And so I think it's a, it's a really great way that we can work together. So today I'm going to interview uh, Michael to find out more about uh, the Smarter German uh, service and how that came about. So Michael, thank you uh, for, for uh, this interview, of no, course. Thank, and Thank you, Michael. And, uh, and thank I'm, you for the opportunity to cooperate as well. I'm really excited to hear, uh, perhaps you could introduce us to what you do at Smarter German and what Smarter German is all about. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question actually. <laughs> it changed over the years. It's, uh, I'm in the eighth year of Smarter German now or maybe the ninth and tenth because you never know when things start, right? So my, my main aim is that people who work with my approach actually enjoy the learning process. Learning is a discovery, something that causes a smile on your face, at times a frown, but basically you, you really just feel thrilled that you understand something that you couldn't before and maybe can communicate with people even though it's a bit bumpy. So I want to create this feeling, this, this kind of joy and, and there's, there's almost the feeling of falling in love when you realize these things. And this is my aim to, to create this and share this with the world because I've experienced it so many times um, in my language courses and also my stays abroad. And even talking about it makes me um, almost want to cry. Yeah, um, it's it's really my aim to to make your life a tiny bit more joyful. Is that fine? And and I I teach German as a means to that. And <laughs> yeah, and I've created a system that is very structured that offers you a very clear form so that you can actually fully relax. You don't have to think whether is it good material or bad material? Do I have to do this next or that next? And how do I do things? All this I've taken from your shoulders. So you just enjoy, you read, you watch, you listen, you do just a tiny little task that's in front of you. And once you're done, you click a button, got it, next. And that's it, it doesn't get any simpler. It's work, yeah, and also work for- You um, have to practice, yeah. Many, many months, but it's beautiful. Nobody cares about the work when they go to the gym, right? So, so you, yeah. are you telling me that I don't need to sit there and think about der, die, das, dem, der, dem all day long? <laughs> well, no, not in that sense. No, unless you want to be a philosopher about why it's der, die, das for a certain word, but no. These, these things are broken down into tiny little steps and anything you need to learn by heart, of which there is a few things, you use a mnemonic uh, kind of memory technique, which is very simple to learn and very easy to apply. And it okay, allows you great. to recall these things easily. Well, I, I would love to hear more about that. But um, the reason why um, uh, you and I were bo both of our names are Michael, but I, I guess your name is more <laughs> Mikhail. Right? Um, yeah. But um, so the, uh, you know, the reason why we're actually uh, cooperating is because you have this story uh, that we are bringing to Glossika. And so I would like to find out more about um, the, the background or the inspiration in creating this story. Yeah, it's uh, like, like many things, uh, things evolve naturally. So in the very beginning of my career, like I've been a teacher for 13 years and then I quit my job because I felt I could do more. Um, I was thinking, what shall I do? And what's the first thing a fresh entrepreneur thinks? Let's make an app. Yeah, of course it's, <laughs> Yeah, very rarely how it really works. And for that app, I thought, let's take a story-based uh, approach and let's create a story. So I hired a young upcoming artist uh, to write a story. And I had the idea back in the past, let's make every chapter about a grammar topic. And 
to a degree he could do that, but he also said it's pretty difficult um, to create a story that's worth reading if you really do this. So I gave him a bit more of a free hand. So he created that story with that in mind. It was already uh, there uh, to learn German. And I wanted it to be a criminal story because criminal stories, you know, we always want to know who's the murderer, who's the culprit. Yeah. And that keeps you going. You, you're curious. You want to learn more. And if you want to learn more, yeah, you, you learn more. So uh, that was the basic idea. The app failed. Um, oh, okay. I, I was too fresh. I was too young. I didn't. Apps know are very hard. <laughs> I've, I, I, I have plenty of I have plenty of friends who started businesses and and, and they do really well with their apps. But they they always warn me, you need to be really prepared. A lot of cash on. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's it's something that I that I am I'm concerned about as well. Is if um, yeah. the apps is is no child's play. <laughs> Yeah, but if you have a product already like you have, it, it, it's a bit easier. Yeah, but it's yeah, it still. Is. Uh, but you have to put together a team and you have to manage it right. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a different business. It is. Yeah. It sure is. <laughs> but so um, the app yeah. luckily failed, and and then I thought, okay, what can I do with it? And I thought, okay, let's let's create an online course. Okay. Yeah, somehow or online materials. So I had PDFs and audio, and I just sold the story, and I created a curriculum around the story, grammar lessons around the story. And then I sold it as a grammar course with a story. And, uh, and it evolved step and step, step by step. I uh, added stuff to it. And at one point, it was so many materials that people had to organize. It. I thought that can be done better. And I created my online course, which allows you to just one click and continue. More or less. Okay. All right. So what we've done, and I'm sure that uh, many of our users who have, have used uh, Glossigal already, as their platform for learning, they, they know that they get sentences in random order. Um, there is a little bit of a, a method to the madness. Uh, we try to make sure that the sentences have some sort of a grammatical co coherency from one sentence to the next. Uh, so when you start learning negative, um, whether that's nicht or kein in German, hopefully you'll be getting all of those in a row <laughs> uh, so that you'll be practicing your negatives with verbs that you've already practiced before. Uh, so we try to keep those patterns stuck together. But of course, now that we, we've developed stories um, together with uh, Smarter German, uh, this means that we, we want to keep that story format in place, moving from one sentence to the next uh, with the order of the story. So we've made some changes uh, to our, our algorithm and how that delivers uh, the content, but it, it keeps nice. the the story in place, because I, I don't think it makes much sense to practice the story <laughs> out of order. Well, it might be funny in a way, but um, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I am very curious to see how it goes in an order first, and then let's see. Yeah. And then while we were working on the story, um, I was also going through and editing some of the, the English translations. And, I, and at that time, I noticed uh, there are a lot of false friends between German. And I noticed, um, I think the word uh, protocol was uh, brought up maybe three times in the story, the German word. Um, and of course we have an English word protocol, which means the, the process in which you do things. Uh, I don't think it's actually originally English. It's not even an mm. originally English word and not even an originally German word. So these words came into our languages in, in a different form of usage. Um, but I, I found that I had, uh, while editing, we should uh, actually use different ways of translating that word in English. So in one case, um, we were discussing what the, the police were going to take a transcription or a record of what was being discussed. And so, you know, in, in one case, we may use the word transcription and in another case, we may use the word record um, or the, the recording mm -hmm. of what um, was being discussed. So I, I'm kind of interested in um, knowing from your experience, what are some of the, um, um, what are some of the issues that you've faced with learners of German uh, in regards to false friends? And maybe not just that, but even with like word order, uh, some verbs look very similar, but, or maybe, um, you know, the, the word order of English can interfere with correct word order in German. As, as I, you know, I feel that German is very, uh, you have to get the word order correct to be understood. To, to an extent, that's definitely the case. So um, false friends, I rather find funny and helpful 
Yeah, and because you know, once you make the mistake, you you get it. For example, gift. Yeah. Oh, I've brought oh. a gift for you. Ich habe dir Gift gebracht. Yeah. Oh, no. I've brought poison to you. Uh, it's a beautiful mistake. Um, one of the most common mistakes would be to spend money. Ich habe ah. Geld gespendet, which is lovely because that means you have donated money. So these tiny things, um, and they help you actually memorize themselves uh, because oh, okay. they are very, very visual in my perception. Yeah, or bald is a wonderful word. If you see bald written, it looks like bald. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. It might not be accurate, bald, yeah. but B-A-L-D. Yeah. So ich komme bald. Uh, people might understand, oh, I'm becoming bald. <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with ich komme bald, I'm, I'm coming soon. Oh, but also this um, word bekommen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Wonderful. at least for a beginner, it's um, a, a, a common word that you need to, uh, to overcome yeah. that feeling of it doesn't mean become. <laughs> now, ich bekomme Vater, ne? you would say in English without the article, I become, a, oh, ich bekomme ein Vater, means you, you receive a father, which receive. is nice as well. But, <laughs> so yeah, these, but these are beautiful and actually kind of helpful. So you um, really like you really like making the the mistake with false friends and then learning having that experience is that is that what you mean? Yeah. And and learning Absolutely. through that experience. Okay. It makes language alive. It it sees there is a similarity, but somehow it's a complete surprise. It's like a joke. A joke plays with your expectations. Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly it, it destroys it. Um, <laughs> more interesting is if someone looks something up in a dictionary and learns vocabulary isolatedly. Yeah, one-on-one, yeah. -on -one. like Tisch means table. Yeah. In most cases, it, it does, right? But Mesa in Spanish, for example, doesn't necessarily mean table. It also means this kind of mountain thingy, uh, mountain plateau or something. So there's always or very often a second meaning to a verb, uh, word. Yeah. And that second meaning might confuse users. Yeah? So if they use Google Translate uh, by looking up individual words instead of the whole phrase, then they might get seriously confused and uh, they always try to learn two, three meanings at once, which is not an approach I can recommend because it just gives you too many options. So this is one of the biggest problems, isolated vocabulary, which is why I work with a story and which I, why I like Klausika, you work with phrases and sentences. Yeah. Um, We've been working actually behind the scenes to um, try to, and it's interesting because if you take if you take like the like the dictionary I see behind you on the shelf, the Oxford Dictionary, or whether that's Duden, uh, perhaps yeah. next to it. Um, but if you have um, if you take an Oxford Dictionary like that, you may find maybe thirty thousand words, fifty thousand words in there. But if you look up the word like take, or set, or have, that you you'll end up with a hundred definitions. And so my my curious my curiosity was, well, how many definitions are in a language? that are in common use, not you know, outside of scientific vocabulary and outside of the billions of things that we have in our world. Like there's a name for every object in the world and there's a billion products made. Yeah. So um, you know, outside of all of those, those many things in the world, I like to focus on the, the human interaction, verbs and, and feelings and things like this. But how many of those meanings are there in a language? And I found that you, know, you, you, could, you could really expand the dictionary if you gave every single one of those words a separate if you gave every single meaning a separate word, you'd have a lot of words to memorize. So languages are very efficient that we combine lots of meanings into a single word, um, you know, like set or take or have or nehmen, you know, in, in yeah. German. So um, there are many, many uses for these words. And I think that's efficiency um, for a language. Um, but I think you're right. You, you, you really have to learn them in context. You have to learn them in a sentence. And that's why I've always been focused um, with our service is, is to put everything into context with a sentence. Um, but that means, you know, how many sentences should we put on Glossika to represent all of these meanings? You may end up with 100,000, 50,000 sentences maybe. Uh, that's a lot. And so um, sometimes we can find efficiencies by combining. Yeah, and you, you also by focusing. So what I've done in Smarter German, the first thing I've done is I've looked through the curriculum and cut the crap. So there's a lot of things you never need, yeah? Like on yeah. a theoretical level, they're interesting, but in practical life, you need a third of that, or maybe right. half. But so the same with this, you don't need to know every single meaning um, or possible use of take or run, run a business, run a car, right. run God knows what, a meeting. And so focus on what matters. And then once you've 
master the base, you can focus on the fringe, yeah, on, on yeah. the more interesting stuff or the specialization. But first, get the basics straight. You want to build a house, and in Germany, you first build a basement. Yeah. yeah, I know that in America it's not always the case, or I'm not sure how it is. You're in Hong Kong, right? So, uh, I mean, how Taiwan. Is there? Yeah. Taiwan, sorry, my ah, no. see, a beautiful full path because I've never been there, so it's hard for me to. So, yeah. I don't know how they build houses there, but we build a base. Yeah. So that the storm may come, everybody is still safe, and then we build the rest. Well, you know, the, the good yeah. comparison with the United States is that uh, every time they have a hurricane, everybody leaves, they escape. And we have nowhere to go when the typhoon comes. So the buildings here are all made out of concrete. Your house yeah. is made out of concrete. And it's the same in Germany. Yeah. I, I lived in Germany. And, and it's yeah. just funny because when you go to the United States, everything is made out of wood. Here in Taiwan, they will put up a wood structure as a, as a demonstration of the future building they're going to put there. Then they tear it down. The wood structure mm -hmm. is the cheap version. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, and then they put up the, the actual, the, the real structure with steel and concrete and that, that becomes the, the long standing one that it can withstand earthquakes and, and um, yeah, the typhoons makes and a lot of sense, right? hurricanes. Yeah, you, you build with them. Um, so I have a question, does water run in German? Or does it? <laughs> no, it does. Das Wasser läuft. So if it, if you don't, läuft, yeah. yeah, if you don't stop the crane, if you don't uh, close it, it uh, das Wasser läuft. Okay, yeah. so in in some cases, yeah, we wouldn't be able to say that in other languages like Chinese. Um, but uh, what do they say? Um, oh, actually, we just say the water is not turned off. Huh. We would just refer to it as as the opposite. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have to, um, you can't just translate things directly. You have to understand the context. You have to see, it's like you see the picture, and you describe it, you know, oh, the water is not turned off. Whereas an English speaker or German speaker may say the water is running. Yeah, so. There's, there's a, it was an interesting study I read 20 years back and I forgot and couldn't find it again about how I think English speakers see the world as, as a, state or may, I don't, either English or German speakers see the world as a state while the others see it as a process. I have to look this up again. Oh, that's fascinating. And, I like this. and this reminds me of this because this is a state, right? The water is not turned on or off. Yes. Why we say the water is running. So, and that's an action. Uh, that's, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. You, you mentioned yeah. language structure, um, sentence structure, which is also what uh, Glossika focuses on or helps actually yeah. mastering, right? Yes. And um, that's indeed a little bit more tricky. The, the most tricky part of it is that we have been trained 10, 20, 30, 40 years at times to, to use words in a certain order in our mother, mother language, mother tongue. Yes. And yes. now German comes along and says, you have to put that part. I have the film seen, yeah? Not I have seen the film. And you think, oh. So you, you have an autobahn here, a data and autobahn in your brain. And, and now suddenly you want to go with your SUV on little little tiny path that still has to be built out and that mm. takes time and repetition yeah so it's not that complex it's just really a matter of fighting against the autobahn until you yeah. have a new pathway and, i think i used to, i think i used a similar metaphor in previous years i would use the the english word rut r-u-t which uh -huh. are the the when the when the uh, the the wheels of a wagon leave the ruts in the road as they uh -huh. continuously drive over the same path. They get deeper mm -hmm. and deeper. And mm -hmm. I like to think you, you build those ruts in your brain. So if they're very um, shallow, then they're difficult, you know, but the deeper they get through practice, based repetition, those ruts grow deeper and deeper. It's like your Autobahn, uh, Autobahn, yeah. I'm sorry for my English pronunciation uh -huh. of the German word, but it's, um, um, <laughs> I yeah, I think- I think it's the same concept because you're, the um, Autobahn is, is a place for driving quickly. Haben Sie jetzt eine Schwierigkeit? I mean, a Schwindigkeit? Um, do you have like a, the, the speed, speed limit? Schwindigkeit Grenzung? Ironically, I think we always have, everybody's always complaining about the Baustelle, the construction sites on the Autobahn. And oh. in most cases, you, can, you, you have a limit of whatever, 100 or 130. So there's only very few places where you can take your Lamborghini and uh, <laughs> push the pedal down. I don't know how you say that. Yeah, and there's, and there's always too many people that you can't you can't really go too fast. Yeah. Well, at night at three it's fine, but then you, yeah. the trucks might be in the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
it's it's a beautiful myth. It's a beautiful idea to to go unlim with unlimited speed. I think humans always want to, <laughs> yeah. Or let's say men, at least most men, yeah. So yeah. I'd like to touch a little bit on the on the German grammar because, um, like we already mentioned, the word order is different. Um, but what if um, and uh, verb tenses tend to be different, um, whereas we we use the the simple past especially with a time phrase in English, like I did that last night mm -hmm. or I did that this morning. And in German, you tend to use, um, you tend not to use the, the simple past unless it's um, a very literary sounding, right? So you tend to, yeah. to use more of the have forms of the verb. Yeah. I, I, I was just counting how many tenses we have. I think we have six tenses in German. And depending on how you count it in English, right, you have the progressive forms as well. So you even have more. Right. In Germany, in German, you But we don't use tenses. subjunctives. Yeah. Ah, that's another thing that comes on top of that. Yeah, yeah, but if, I were, so if I were in Germany, wäre ich in Deutschland sein? Is that how I would say it? <laughs> würde, yeah, wäre is already would be. So yeah. if you say wäre would sein, be. it would be would be be. <laughs> would be be, okay. Yeah, I would be be in Germany. I like that ah. actually. That's a <laughs> cute song. So um, it's very simple in Germany. You, you you talk about the past, you use the past. You talk about yeah. now or the future, you use the present tense. That's all. But yeah. people get exposed to the preteritum, what you call a simple past ish. Yeah, um, it's not necessary for the first levels until right. B one, and and after that, it's really like you say uh, in official documents or in in, in literary. Uh, texts that you come across it and you mainly have to just be able to comprehend it which is doable very doable oh, yeah. with a bit of practice you don't uh, so normally people are not, are not producing this in their normal conversations it's just only a handful of words ah okay ich hatte geburtstag ich war im kino and then the modal verbs ich konnte nicht kommen i couldn't come ich musste so, arbeiten so it, it's very, so this is um this is actually the uh something where grammar books can add, ac actually lead you astray uh so if i if i were to open up a grammar book of german i'm going to see all of those verb tables with here's the first conjunctive and the second uh, you know yeah. and then yeah. you think well i have to memorize all of these and then i have to use this correct but you're telling us that normally um those are just nice to know uh, nice to um, to understand, but it's not something that you need to be uh, that you need to produce or be productive. Is that correct? No, absolutely, absolutely not. That's totally correct. Okay. Yeah, it, just just observe how the people around you speak and see what they use. That's something in the beginning that's tricky, but once you have a little grasp of the language, you you can realize oh they never say this. There might be regions in Germany where this is different. Yeah, all oh, right. The south of Germany uses um, the the plüke parfait, how you call this, uh, the past perfect more often than we do. Ah, but, so. but that's really a regional thing. Yeah, you pick that up when you get there. And it's not difficult at all. Yeah, it's just practice. And it's once you realize it, you hear it everywhere. It's like you want to buy a car and it needs to be red. And suddenly you see red cars everywhere. Yeah, before you didn't notice. There were as many red cars before as well, of course. So it's not... Grammar is, grammar is something people hate or love. And in either way, grammar is just a tiny bit of that experience that you have. Grammar is in every sentence. Yeah, yeah? sure. You don't need extra grammar lessons with Glossika, right? So well, we, you know, I'm, I'm a lover of grammar and I have that problem. I fall into the grammar books and I think that I have to memorize <laughs> all of these. And I, I built Glossika to try to pull myself away from that habit because Beautiful. I know that being able to analyze the sentences and being able to talk about the grammar in much in so much depth does not mean that I have productive ability. I cannot necessarily speak the language well. And so Glossika has been there as a tool also for myself, the founder, as something that I can do to practice putting everything into context in, into those sentences, which I find is, is um, very useful. Um, and I think that if you have a basic understanding of of the grammar of any language, you can really get started with um, Glossika, and I hope, hopefully, with the story, with the German story that we're adding now. Um, yeah. You know, with a basic, a basic idea of how German works, you can go ahead and, and get started with the story. Um, but you know, we we get we get questions from our customers uh, regarding grammar all the time, and when are we going to build this feature into Glossika? And I'm not sure that we will. 
uh, because I think it, it de send them to me, Michael. But it, it detracts. Right. So we have a we had a a customer just recently ask. You know, um, I started. He he's saying I I started to experience. He's an experienced language learner. He speaks Spanish and other languages. But um, he said I started to experience this verb werden everywhere, and here it's um, wird, and here it's wurden or geworden. You know, or in a, and then he says, you know, I'm not sure I'm understanding how this word is used. I mean. So this is a highly high frequency function word. How do you, how would you explain to uh, somebody like this on acquiring the use of these function words in their different, yeah. because werden in, in, the, in the normal tense just means will, will do, right? And it's, well, um, yeah. Uh, and in, in other cases, when you use it in conjunction with other verbs, it can take on many different meanings. Yeah, I, this, uh, I just recently had a, what I call masterclass, which is a webinar about this topic, right? Because people are always confused. The first thing people do is they look up werden in the dictionary and then they see to become, ich werde Vater, I become a father. And oh, right. um, so uh, funny enough, it's only in 1% of the cases, if at all, that werden actually means to become. So the dictionary is of no help here. And as you already described, werden most of the time, actually, I think I, I just... Say, I think I said it opposite just now. I said future because that's the first thing that came to my mind. But it actually means to become. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was thinking yeah. will first, but that's actually in com combination with another verb. <laughs> future is actually, in my experience, the second most use of werden. But the, oh, the second most. Ironic, yeah, and ironically, the future in German is actually almost never used for the future itself. It's used to make assumptions. For example, ich werde wohl später kommen. I will probably come later. So yes, there's a, f of course, later there's something happening in the future, but it's more about a probability, a prediction uh -huh. and assumption. So in 99% in of 90% of the cases, we uh, use it for making assumptions. We wouldn't say, ich werde ins Kino gehen. Yeah? yeah, I will go to the cinema. That makes no sense. In German, we say, ich gehe ins Kino, present tense, that's it. Right. And, the and, most, I, and I think that yeah. differs from English quite a bit because uh, I've, taught, I've taught English before and the, the thing is with English is that English speakers use the present continuous almost exclusively to refer to the future. And it's only when you're absolutely sure you're going to do something. Yes, I will go to the theater tonight. <laughs> you know, yes. I, yeah. I've decided that I'm going. I'm, I actually know that I'm going, but I will, yeah. I will be there, you know. <laughs> And, it's, it's, and you have going to future as well and with you. Right. You have to make decisions and decisions and decisions. God knows what consequences that has uh, for your culture. But in Germany, yeah. in German, you just say, ich gehe ins Kino. Yeah? But present. I think that if, if you're exposed enough to those conversations and how people speak, you're able to pick apart, oh, yeah. here he said it one way, here he said it another way. And you can get a, get a feeling, well, here he said it with Kino and here he said it with something else. And I get a feeling for how people are saying that. And I think that that's the advantage yeah. of using the stories and the context of sentences. Yes, but you have to see, keep in mind, you, you need, you and I, we are very analytical minds, yeah? If, if I may uh, make that assumption with you, but uh, entrepreneurs usually are at least successful ones <laughs> are capable of analyzing situations and learning from it. So if you wrote down all the occurrences of Verden, yeah? And, and kind of looked, okay, what do they have in common? Here's Verden on its own, it means to become. Here's Verden with an infinitive, oh, that's a future tense. Here's Verden uh, with an infinitive of haben and sein and a past participle, that's future too. Then there's Verden with a past participle, that's a passive, which is the most common passive. occurrence of Verden. So yeah. if you did that, fine, you could differentiate that. And some people pick that up intuitively, but yeah. making this clear, and you asked me how to teach it, teaching things, that are similar is, is a tricky thing. Um, that's why you don't learn synonyms at once because uh, you confuse them later or what well, synonyms yeah. are not a problem because you usually can use them whenever. But so I teach things step by step and take a break in between and then comes the next thing. So you won't learn all the uses of Verden in a row. You would learn them with a month apart or a couple of weeks apart. Right. Once right. one thing has settled, you have a base and then you can put a cherry on top of the cream. And and this is how it works. And I start with the most frequent use of that because that's what you hear everywhere if you watch videos or if you are already living in a German-speaking country. 
around you. And this is the, this is the beauty of it. So take similar things apart. There's something we call an inhibition of similar information. So if you learn similar information in, a, in succession, then it, it, you confuse information. And therefore, yeah. you need breaks in between. And, and taking breaks is one of the most important things to do when learning anything. Yeah, sure. I also fi find that it's, it's helpful to uh, share what you've learned with another person. Absolutely. Uh, it helps, uh, helps make sure that you understand it yourself as well. Yeah. But do, that's, a, that's a problem because you need to find someone to learn with, to study with. And if in, in school or if you find when someone, it's a, that's, that's fine. No? But when it's a language, get out there and, and speak with a friend. In, in, in that sense also, yeah. So <laughs> not talking about it, but just talking it. Yeah, yeah using I it. Like yeah. All right. Thank yeah, you, Michael, for, for this um, interview today.